Welcome. I'm Liz Taylor, ocean explorer, naturalist, and entrepreneur. I'm Sylvia Earle, oceanographer, explorer, the National Geographic, and founder of Mission Blue, and an ocean elder. Thank you, ocean elders, for uh, sponsoring us. Absolutely. And this is our show, Dive In, where we host informal and open conversations with the ocean community on topics of wonder and interest. We're glad to be back in um, 2023 and hope everyone has had some time to get outdoors. And we are going to um, dive in here in just a minute. And as we're going through the conversation, please put your any questions that come up in the Q&A box, and we're going to get to those at the end of the conversation. And before we get going, we want to remind everybody that the world is it's blue, blue, it is. <laughs> <laughs> just like your jacket. Yeah. <laughs> Today, we are really excited to have a sea star with us, Dr. Rich Moy from the California Academy of Sciences. Rich, can you uh, turn on your video and microphone? Well, I have to say, I think there he is. I think that uh, our guest is an endangered species, sadly, because people who dive in deeply as taxonomists, as thematists, who really get to know a group of creatures, plants, animals, bacteria, whatever, we really, really need them, especially now when we're losing so much so fast. Having, you know, I consider you a world treasure. You are. <laughs> uh, the, you, thou flatterest me, <laughs> but thank you for that. Um, I, actually, I actually share that opinion because the... Uh, number of people that are out there who um, are actually doing the work of assessing biodiversity with with knowledge of all of the different types of critters that you might find out there is is actually not large. Um, I can count the number of close colleagues that work on sea urchins, for example, my my real love in life, uh, except, of course, for my family um, <laughs> that um, on, on the fingers of one hand, basically. So um, it's very kind of you to point that out. And I think it's it's crucial that you continue to do the work that you do to try and attract young folks into the fold so yes. that we can uh, build on, on um, what we've started and, and hope that it carries on into the future because there's so much more to know. So I'll just have to ask, are you having fun? Am I having fun? Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> my whole life I've had nothing but fun, I think, basically. <laughs> to the well, chagrin of, of, of some people who work in cubicles and offices and places like that, they think, oh man, you get to do that? I, I won't hide the fact, though, that, that it can be very hard work. You know this, having worked in the field yourself. Yeah. 18-hour days are not unusual. No, they're not. and But it's so rewarding when you get a chance to to really see, you know, a kid light up about when they see a sea exactly, star. Exactly. Exactly. Or, or one of these from beautiful a, things. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Came from yeah. a young lady that that was doing a fundraiser and Mission Blue, and so she brought she brought the sea star in, and she goes, "I just love radial symmetry." <laughs> <laughs> He's nine years old. Heard that one you know, it's just great. You know? <laughs> I hadn't heard that before. Loving radial symmetry. I I love I like bilateral symmetry too. Yeah. But, uh, but radial symmetry is is clearly the the hallmark of the things that I'm going to talk about today. So. Five part radial symmetry. Yes, five part. You know the, the sea stars, the cucumbers, the the lilies, and yes, the urchins, the best. Absolutely. Oh, awesome. here they are. Oh, there they are. So um, these are examples of some of the things that um, I've spent quite a large portion of my academic life studying. We have the starfish, also known as the asteroidia, aster meaning star. Uh, so the star-shaped things, the brittle stars, the Ophiroidea, and Ophio uh, is a, a, a an old uh, classic word meaning snake. So these are also yeah. uh, sometimes known as the snake stars or um, uh, uh, yeah, serpent snake stars. Serpent stars. Yeah, yeah. the uh, basket the brittle, stars. Yeah, the brittle star comes from the fact that they lose their arms if you handle them too roughly. Yeah, to to live again um, another day. If the, uh, <laughs> if the arm comes off, they can make their getaway with what's left. Um, so it's uh, quite an impressive way of dealing with life, a little bit like the lizard tail story, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, sea cucumbers, holothuroidia. Now, the, the etymology, the, the, the background of that name is a little hard. I, I, I've had some trouble. I hope maybe someday somebody will, when I, when I try to explain to them what I think it means, holo meaning entirely and thuros meaning ugly. So entirely oh ugly, <laughs> it's kind of 
it's a little Sad. mean, but I do hope that somebody will t uh, correct me at some point in the future if, if they happen to know better. Um, the sea cucumbers are surprisingly enough also echinoderms in spite of the, the preponderance of soft bodied forms in that, but you can see their five part radial symmetry uh, if you look closely. And yeah, in their tentacles. In their tentacles, exactly. And then the tentacles branch and branch again, but in multiples of five. Yeah, they're just beautiful. And, and of course, the sea lilies. And the sea, the sea lilies are almost living fossils. They're holdovers from a time when there were many, many other species of sea urchins or uh, uh, sea lilies in, in, that we know about in the fossil record, mostly in the Paleozoic. Entire rock formations are made of the ossicles that uh, come from um, decayed and broken up sea lilies. But there are some living species and um, they are endlessly fascinating. Many of them are um, what are called feather stars, which don't have this beautiful stalk running along the bottom uh, that hold them to the, to the sea bottom. We're gonna have a look at those again later in a, in a sort of interesting um, interaction with, with uh, sea urchins. Yeah. But especially sea urchins. I've always loved sea urchins. Um, and when I started my, my thesis work, it was on the sand dollars and they still remain nearest and dearest um, to my hard urchin. <laughs> um, <I wonder. laughs> this, this, is, this is a hard urchin. And, and look at that one that, that Liz has there. It's an incredible thing. That's Plagiobrisis, which um, is one of the largest sea urchins that you can find in shallow water in the Caribbean. And it's, it's, people look at that and they say, oh, that doesn't look anything like the sea urchin in the upper left of the slide here. Um, but in fact, it is related. And we'll get into a little bit about how they're related and, and uh, why they look so different. They're so fun to find, you know, counter them in the wild. <laughs> yeah, you have to be a little careful with the plagiobrisis because although that, that animal has had all of the spines removed, <laughs> um, when it has the spines on it, it lives just below the surface of the sand. And when it's disturbed, it raises these four or five inch long spines, which have points on them that will go right through your finger. So um, finding them by running your fingers through the sand, yeah, I don't recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask if you'd ever sat upon a sea urchin. <laughs> uh, I've, I've been hit by sea urchins a number of times, including some of the deep sea ones, which have very, very toxic spines. And it's like, yeah. let me tell you, it's like putting your finger in a, in a wall socket. Yeah, it, it hurts. Yeah. <laughs> some people are afraid of sharks, but all things considered, I think more people get um, <laughs> damaged by, by urchins. Yeah. You know. um, and if people have questions about what to do when that happens, I'd be happy to answer those later. But I yeah I, yeah yeah your yeah. questions yeah they're they're important questions for if you're a human swimming around in an environment like the ocean where you yeah. you weren't born. <laughs> um, so uh, we're going to talk about the sea urchins themselves, which are at at the branch point above the number four there. Um, but the other members of the, of the phylum, the big group to which they belong include, as we were just saying, uh, the sea lilies, which are the first ones to branch off in the tree of life, uh, and then the sea cucumbers and the sea urchins. And then finally, um, we have a branch that contains the starfish and the brittle stars. And that gives you a kind of an idea of, of how these different, really radically different looking things uh, are related one to another. But we're gonna focus on, um, the sea urchins and our our little spiny buddies here have been uh, they've been appreciated and loved for a lot longer than I've been around. Yeah, um, these incredible burial sites have been found in in Europe that um, have uh, this this happens to be this uh, four thousand year old skeleton of a woman who was buried with hundreds of um, uh, fossil sea urchins, as it turns out. So whether they're alive or as fossils, they seem to hold a a tremendous fascination for people. Um, it's and, just beautiful. And they're held in reverence. Uh, thunderstones, they would, they would be called. And I think they felt that they were some sort of evidence of, of a deity. Um, I don't exactly know exact uh, what, and maybe nobody knows exactly what the significance of this, uh, was, but there, there were great things to be buried in. So <laughs> um, 
the Viking, oh, I did just the, the Viking necklace pendant, that's a photo I just took in, in Copenhagen um, of a beautiful uh, exhibit that they had there on the Vikings. And I was really surprised to see this wonderful pendant, um, which has this nice metal work to hold it in a pendant. And boy, I wanted, I wanted to get that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let you put it, take it on loan, you know. <laughs> what a conversation piece at parties that would be. <laughs> That's right. Well, some artists out there, maybe they'll yeah, yeah. find something like that for you. Absolutely. Um, the other guy that kind of appreciated um, sea urchins was Salvador Dali. And um, he loved them almost as much as I do. And he claimed that if you made this rig where you held this, this wonderful um, sea urchin test or, or skeleton, up on a stand and put a little eyepiece on one side. Uh, you could look through that to see, and he, he was a strange fellow. Uh, I don't think anybody would deny that, but he claimed that if when you looked through that perfect radial symmetry um, and looked at your painting, that was really the only way to find out that the painting was finished. <laughs> so I... <I'd, I'd, laughs> I don't know why that is, but he revealed this in his 50 Secrets of Magic Craftsmanship, which is the most incredible book I've ever read. It's just- right, We got to find a copy now. <laughs> he, he, was, he was an interesting guy. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> so know your urchins. Some general features about sea urchins, as we mentioned earlier, they, they do have radial symmetry. They have five-part radial symmetry, uh, symmetry that is centered on the mouth, which is on the bottom. Uh, of the body here. Yeah. Um, and there is an apical system, which is at the apex, at the top of the animal here. And that's where the anus comes out. Uh, that's what you see in your regular commoner garden sea urchin. <laughs> the internal skeleton of a sea urchin is made of limestone, basically. It's, it's wow. um, calcium carbonate. Um, that is carefully secreted in these incredible uh, and beautiful geometrically precise ways by the physiological machinery of the sea urchin itself. And that makes an internal skeleton. It's, it's truly like your skull. It's an internal skeleton. It's covered with skin. There are muscles on the outside that make the spines work and so on. So technically it's an internal skeleton and not a shell. I tell my students, if I hear you call it a shell, I'm going to have to kill you. <laughs> so um, they learn very quickly that the special word for this is a test. Yes. This is only a test. Only a test, yes. If this were a real sea urchin, and it is a real sea urchin, then I would be holding it up to show you. <laughs> um, so the test is uh, really the body of the urchin. It, it, it encompasses the internal organs, but there are also external features as well that allow the animal to interact with its environment. Uh, and the, and um, uh, oh, could we go back for just a second? Because I, I did want to say how this radial symmetry is expressed. There are five places where the two feet come out and the two feet help it walk. So that's called an ambulacrum. Um, and they're also in, arranged in columns that run from the mouth to the top of the animal. From, from the mouth here, here's, here's that band that comes, comes all the way up to the apex of, of the animal. And in between that, here, for example, logically enough, that's called the interambulacrum. And that's, that's going to be a little bit significant in what I, what I have to say next. All right. So a regular sea urchin, a nice, nice round one like this that has the bigger spines and so on, as I said, has the anus on the top and the mouth on the bottom. But we also have this big group called the irregular sea urchins. In like which, in, yeah, and, they're, and like, like regularity, it has, has to do with the anal opening, right? Um, so, so the anus is positioned at the back end. It's actually moved from the top of the animal around to, to one edge. And that has given the test it, uh, a superimposed new axis of symmetry, and they're actually bilateral now. So these animals have evolved to move in one direction through the sediment. 
anterior end, posterior end, functionally. Yeah. 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 Anatomically, like that has nothing whatsoever to do with your elementary tract and, the, and so on. It's a completely different superimposed axis of symmetry that has nothing to do with bilaterality of worms and people and fish and so on. So interesting. Um, Very and the, 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 so these are called the irregular urchins because their symmetry is not regular. And that has opened up to this other branch of sea urchins, a whole new realm of exploring the habitats in which um, these animals live and has given rise to a, an enormous and interesting, certainly to me anyway, uh, biodiversity of form that makes their um, uh, study so endlessly fascinating. Inside uh, a sea urchin is a magic lantern. I'm sure that that's what uh, Salvador Dali would call it anyway. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's an incredible structure made up of some 30 odd pieces of calcium carbonate skeleton. Again, this is basically just limestone that the animal manipulates to form all of these very intricate structures inside um, that hold five teeth. Of and course. The teeth, the, <laughs> so the teeth, the teeth are arranged so that they meet like the, if you think of a chuck of a drill that holds the drill bit, um, they can move in and out. And there's a set of muscles that open up these pieces. The whole structure can be pushed out through the mouth uh, and used to grind up little uh, bits of plant matter to rasp on rocks. And the teeth are a little bit harder form. They're called, um, they, they have a higher amount of uh, magnesium in them that, that makes them uh, stronger, uh, very tough, resistant. To, and they also have a, a structure in them that is constantly sharpening. You know, your, your box cutters that have the snap off ends. Right. Well, these are a little bit like that. They, they maintain their sharpness uh, throughout life by breaking off little pieces at the end that reveal a new cutting edge. So it's, it's just a, you think about how evolution has come by this in something that is so evidently simple when you first look at it. Um, it's, it's hard to imagine the span of time that, that has resulted in these incredible um, evolutionary uh, changes. In, yeah, in it's just the adaptations. Ways. So it's just the adaptations are, are stunning. So how many millions of years have echinoderms kind of been around? Uh, echinoderms kind of have been around about a half a billion years. Half a billion. Um, yeah, and, and about a hundred million years after the first echinoderms kind of appeared on Earth. Um, about 400 million years ago, in the Ordovician period, in the early Paleozoic, you have you get the first things that you could legitimately call a sea urchin. Huh. They looked a little different from what we have today, as you might imagine. Yeah, um, but they're they're um, also part of a, a large program of of study that I'm engaged in right now, and they're 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 truly amazing as well. How they could possibly have come upon that morphology, so. Long before there are trees and birds and things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a little bit longer, yes. Um, certainly. But, um, the, but the spines and the feet, I think, are some of the coolest things. You know, I mean, I love the the tests. But yeah. So so um, the spines are wonderful, um, and they are make they are what makes a sea urchin a sea urchin, right? They are the first point of of contact between you and a sea urchin and literally <laughs> um, the, sea, the sea urchins um, use them for a variety of different things the the spines actually sit on these little bumps they're called tubercles all over the surface of the of the test and if if you take a spine this this thing has had the spines removed this ap happens to be a spine from this specimen and fit it over one of these bumps the ball and socket joint is so perfect. There's a ring of muscles around the base of the spine so that they can be moved in any direction. And that's helpful for locomotion, but it, they can also direct a whole wad of these things right at you um, as you approach. They like have- a porcupine. <laughs> yeah, they can sense you coming. They can feel the, the, the uh, shock waves through the, um, and, and even detect light to a certain extent to the point where they can, they can see where a, the direction from which a threat might be coming. The spines, of course, are found all over the 
all over the test. There's a whole bunch of different kinds. There's toxic ones, there's non-toxic ones, there's protective ones, there's layers underneath that do other things. And when you get into the irregular urchins, the types of spines are off the charts in diversity. And that one you um, held up had like the, it was like the pencil one, right? It had like these really thick spines. Yeah, this is actually not a pencil urchin. Oh, this one here is a pencil urchin. Yeah, that guy. Yeah, that guy. And so you can see all of the spines mounted on their on their um, tubercles on this animal. And you can even see one's come a little bit loose and, and it moves around on top of that. Um, the, the, the spines on the one that I showed you, this is actually not a, uh, believe it or not, a slate pencil urchin, but um, they, they are collected, some, they, they sound nice in the wind, and so they make wind chimes out of them. <laughs> um, but, and they wash up in huge numbers because they're almost indestructible. But I like, I like to think of them as, as, as chopsticks. <laughs> um, they're very very uh robust and they would work well as chopsticks and maybe, who knows, maybe they were among the very first things to be used as chopsticks um so the two feet um that we were um just looking at a second ago are the major way that these sea urchins interact with their environment they're basically fleshy tubes that can extend outward from can we go back just a little bit Liz? yeah so if you if you look at the upper image you can see these little things that look like they have suction cups on the ends. And those are the tube feet. And those are the, those are extremely important to, they are make, they are what makes echinoderms echinoderms basically. Um, and they're used in everything from respiration to feeding and locomotion and very, very important structures. Um, anybody who's seen one of these things in the tide pools have seen the tube feet. And felt them sometimes. Walk across your hand. Yeah, they'll, you, they'll, <laughs> there is a suction cup action, um, but most of the adhesiveness is from a, a, a chemical adhesive, which is, which can be um, um, secreted by the end of the tube foot and then is released chemically also. So they can stick to almost anything, including your face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but these things, these things, uh, when I first started learning about these things, I thought, there's no way these things could exist, um, but they do. And when you look very closely in between the spines and in between the two feet, you'll see that there's some other things. And at first, scientists who saw these thought that they were actually other organisms stuck to or parasitizing the surface of the, of the sea urchin. Um, and so they gave them a genus name. They called them Pedicillaria. And that's why they got their name. Um, and that just means that they're little stocked things topped by a jaw apparatus. This is not connected to a gut. It doesn't do anything um, in terms of feeding uh, nutrient into the animal. They're protective and cleansing. Um, there's a, a whole bunch of different kinds, including a, a kind that has these poison glands set around almost syringe-like tips. They're very small but they're very effective in large numbers and they can be used um, for defense if they're approached by a soft bodied animal, they, they will actually clamp on, inject the, the, the toxins and um, try and persuade the attacker to, to go away. But there are many different kinds. One of the, my favorite kinds um, is, the, is a, a small kind called a triphyllis and, and they're very, very small. They have leaf-like valves, leaf-like, um, jaw structures on the end and they're used to clean the skin of the animal the epithelium of the wow. sea urchin and they gather up bacterial plaques and things like that and commensal inside that three-part leaf-like jaw are ciliates the single-celled protozoa that's that that's live true. commensally with the sea urchin inside the jaw and feed on the bacteria that's wild. So <laughs> these, that's, these very closely connected associations of diverse it's incredible creatures. Yeah. You know, if you lose yeah. a sea urchin, you also lose the ciliate and you, you lose and them. who knows, maybe that's you know the only place where those ciliate species might be found. So you lose that diversity as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And the little crabs that creep over the surface and same inside. thing with little oh. crabs that live live commensally on, on sea urchins. It's it's amazing. There's a connectivity with everything, and I'm going to tell the story about that. Yeah, connectivity. everything connects. 
But it's um, so cool to look at their life cycle here. Yeah, it is good to look at the life cycle because I often get asked, okay, how do these things reproduce? Well, boy urchins and girl urchins are separate. They're males and females. Um, the males, of course, release the sperm. The females release the eggs into the water. And they do this. Sometimes they move closer to each other to do this, but a lot of times it's kind of a Hail Mary. Um, <laughs> let's, let's hope that this works and that the sperm and the eggs combine. Um, obviously, it works fairly well because there are lots of sea urchins. Um, then they fertilize, they, the sperm fertilize the eggs, they form a zygote, and then they develop into, it's, it's almost, if you hold your hand kind of like this with your fingers splayed out, they look a little bit like that, a little swimming hand. And they actually yeah. swim with the fingers forward. <laughs> so they have these arms on them that are covered in cilia. What could be cilia? Yes. Um, cilia are tiny little hairs rising from the, the cells. And these things are really, really, really tiny. I mean, they're a quarter of a millimeter at the most. Um, and they use these to swim and they gather up food. The mouth is in the center and they feed for a while until they become what is known as competent to settle. They become ready to settle down and they actually have a chemical sensory process whereby they can detect where uh, the adults are living. And mm -hmm. they say, oh, there are adults down there. It's probably an okay to settle down. So there's an adaptation to finding a new place to settle. And they settle down. They metamorphose by getting rid of those funny little arms, the fingers on my on my hand, and turning into a tiny little sea urchin. They look like just like a little lander coming down, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, almost. Yeah, that's like, like, and the little lander there, that's the very first tube feet to form in the larva. That's great. Yeah. They, so this, the the other larva, larva, yeah, the one, the, the larva at the top of the page doesn't have tube feet, but the one on the, on the right-hand side does. Yep. And when those coming feet, down. Yeah. And those feet come down, <laughs> <laughs> and he yep. lands roger we're ready we're we're a go for landing <laughs> that's great it reminds you of some of the like the scientific instruments that we that we sometimes build for people and you know you've got the little lander feet and it's just like that <laughs> well you could do worse than than by putting five of them on there with sticky bottoms yeah right <laughs> absolutely um so let's talk a little bit about sea urchin diversity before we get into some stories they're very um catholic if you will uh in their tastes in terms of depth, uh, living everywhere from uh, coastal intertidal zones and sometimes even um, uh, high up enough in the intertidal that you can find them at um, in, a, in a low tide, mm -hmm. uh, all the way down to the deepest parts of the ocean, um, hadal depths, mostly abyssal, but occasionally hadal forms. Um, there, are, there are sea urchins there too. We've seen some of the ROV that are you know down four or five, you know, close to 6,000 meters down, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not along. surprised. And sometimes they're the only thing that you see that's obvious um, yeah. and moving because they do they do walk across the sea bottom. Um, a lot of these deep sea ones have little hooves on the bottoms of their spines um, that allow them to run over the sea bottom uh, without sinking into the ooze. That they, sediment's so fine down there. It's, and it's, the sediment is incredibly fine. It, it just, if you, you know this, if you're in a submersible or if you're, if your ROV touches the bottom, you get this oh, yeah, just like plume. <laughs> plume, yeah. Uh, and these guys are dealing with that all the time. You can actually see little puffs of, of the ooze come up off the ends of the spines as they <laughs> use the little hooves. <laughs> It's actually really kind of cool. <laughs> that sounds very cool. <laughs> so when, the, when the would be deep sea miners say, hey, there's nothing down there, just some urchins and, and sea cucumbers, as if that's nothing. As I, if that's nothing. It's just, yeah. Yeah. We're, I just read a paper the other day that described like five new species of, of these deep sea um, sea urchins, which are interesting from another point of view too. And that is that they have soft bodies, so they don't have to secrete so much calcium carbonate at those deep depths where the reaction for taking calcium ions and carbonate ions out of the seawater is actually driven backwards by the pressure. Wow. So they're fighting against that, that um, headwind of depositing calcium carbonate to make the test. So they economize a little bit by making the test super thin and using most of the connective tissue to connect all those plates together that make the test. So they're floppy. If you if you pick them up, don't do this because they're extremely <laughs> poisonous. They compensate for that lack of protection afforded by the thick test by covering themselves in, in um, 
the most toxic spines that I know of any wow. group of sea urchins. I know that I, I've been hit by them and um, just a couple of spines it feels like sticking your finger in a wall socket and it takes several hours. It took several hours, just, just a couple of these spines in the tip of my finger, oh. took several hours for me to feel everything in, in that arm again. So, yeah, pretty um, potent. We yeah, you don't, you don't want to handle a whole bunch of them, that's for sure. <laughs> no, no, we always build little like devices to, you know, collect collect them if we need to for scientists. And, right, spoons, yeah. scoops. And, yeah, the kitchen store is a great place to, you know, find like collection devices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the the um, the kitchen um, dishwashing gloves aren't aren't good enough. No. They they go no. right through that. So yeah. I wonder if they are less affected by acidification than some of the other creatures. It's, it's difficult to know. I think by by virtue of the fact they're living in the abyss, they may be less affected in the in the long run. But uh, um, in the short run, but in the long run, yes, as as the oceans acidify they may be more resistant it's hard to know they are still to. building very intricate calcium carbonate structures right they have to be perfect or they won't work well so yeah. any sort of acidification is is a bad thing yeah especially for the larvae i, I would imagine yeah, that, that yeah. Would be most vulnerable yeah then. and I, I i just wanted to point out where where are you going to find sea urchins well you find them everywhere um they live uh, from Antarctica to um, to to the Arctic, and they're very common in the tropics. Some of the hot spots are in the tropics: the Gulf of uh, Mexico and the Caribbean, the Red Sea, and um, Malaysia, the Indian Ocean. That's those sorts of areas have lots of species. But the real, the 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 hottest of the hot is really the Philippines. After several years of research there, um, I've been able to document uh, over 200 species in that archipelago alone. And um, that's a just a staggering number because that is actually one sixth of the world's diversity of sea urchins. Um, it's, it's a hot spot for other <clears throat> creatures as well. Yeah, we saw we in our when we had our conversation with uh, with Terry Gosling, he was talking about how it's also that hot spot for the, the nudibranchs. Abs absolutely. And that's because oh. we're in the coral oh. triangle. And the coral triangle is the single most diverse ecosystem um, biome, if you will, um, in the world's oceans. And this is the center of the center of the center. <laughs> all right. I need more of the coral need, triangle. More more hope spots over there. Yeah. We'll protect all of it. <laughs> protect it. Yeah. Yes. And and we have a lot of help there. We've been working with um, um, the folks who live in the Philippines and, and the, um, they've been um, incredible partners in all of the work that we've been doing in the Philippines. And uh, they're excited to, to learn. That, and and um, here's the thing, the census of marine life says, you know, the bottom line, the deeper you go, the less we know. Mm. And the more new discoveries we find. So huh, what else, who else is down there that we haven't yet been able to get acquainted with them? Yes, and we need, and, and that's a very good point, and we need all the help we can get. Um, and um, being able to work with our partners in places that have the diversity that we're talking about in the Philippines is, is, um, is precious to us. Yeah, and, um, it's, so, it's so important to get, you know, the people who live there that really, you know, care about the place right. to, to get engaged in its protection. Right, and it's all, it's all we can do to, to, to um, the least actually we can do is to leave something behind to to help them understand um, why we found it interesting in the first place. And I think there's a sense of pride um, that yeah, comes out absolutely. of all of these interactions. And uh, and we love we love working with the people of the Philippines so much. So um, there's a lot of diversity in search and sea urchins in terms of size. This is a, a very large species of sea biscuit. Um, yes. happens to be the type species of this species, Clypeaster latissimus. I photographed it at the Museum of Natural History in Paris. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not even the biggest sea urchin. There are sea urchins that are even bigger. And of course, when you add, when you take a, um, uh, a sea urchin test that's this big and you add the spines to that, you can have balls of spines that are like almost a couple of feet across. Incredible. Um, and the one in the upper right there is an example of one of the very small, it also happens to be a, a member of the sand dollar group. Um, 
which is um, probably the smallest known sea urchin. That might be a sand dime. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's it's small change for sure. <laughs> sand nickel, yeah. <laughs> but they are valuable because they're they're actually among some of the more rarely encountered of of um, all of the sea urchins. And, I can just and imagine you know, you're just kind of looking. You, you just miss that little little dude if you aren't really. You would yeah. you would miss them, but when they do occur, they occur in huge numbers. Um, it's just that. There are few, there are many and far between. <laughs> oh, wow. And then there's diversity in terms of shape. That one in the upper left is a deep sea one that maybe you've encountered. It's got these strange fleshy balloons on the tops of the spines and nobody's so too cool. sure exactly what those are for. Um, Big red, which is a new species from the Philippines in the upper center there. And on the right is a, an limpet-like um, sea urchin that lives on the shores of places like Hawaii, for example. That's really, see, it looks like a pangolin. <laughs> it looks like a pangolin, but those are actually the flattened ends of very short spines that shed the energy of the waves. And you can see there's a rim of flattened spines as well that help deflect the energy of the waves that are coming in and allowing this animal to, to stick to the rock. They also have a huge number of tube feet on the bottom yeah, to help stuck them. Stuck on, yeah. And deep. on the lower, on, on the middle left is a um, another type of deep sea thing uh, related to some of the black spine sea urchins that you see in the tropical places like diadema or diadema, as some people like to call it, <laughs> because they 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 have very long spines that come to a point. But in this particular one, they're curved downward, and they actually walk holding the test up off the sea bottom on the top wow. of the spines, um, almost like your worst nightmare if, if you could turn that into a, a, a horror movie of some kind. In fact, I think I've seen things like Similar, that. yeah, in, inspired by nature, yeah. <laughs> Direct center, center um, pride of, of place there is a, an animal that I, I love. It's a type of sand dollar um, called uh, Rochula, lives in the west uh, coast of Africa. Um, not very uh, well known its habits are very poorly understood and it has all these very strange slots and holes and bells and whistles that uh, other sand dollars don't have um, so I, I really like working with that one to the right of that is a, a, a heavily spined one um, this is the test of that species um, and it can live also in very high energy environments lots of wave action it uses those spines to jack itself into crevices to keep from washing away. The lower left is another deep sea form, looks almost like, almost more like a, a medusa, like a, some sort of jellyfish, um, but it has these very strange little upturned spines uh, that um, go around the outer rim of, of the body of the test. In the center is another one that rumbles along across the bottom, also very, very thin tested, but it's, it's, it's test is, is actually stiff, but if you hold it up to the light, you can see its internal organs. So it's uh, very, very thin, thinner than eggshell. Really beautiful. Same, same thing with the one on the right, which I threw in there as the sort of the extreme. That's a deep sea thing called Portalesia. It looks a little bit like a medicine bottle. Um, the anterior end is actually on the left-hand side. And you can just see that dark area on the right, which is the anal opening. And that's, it worms its way through the deep sea ooze. <laughs> Almost looks like a worm. So let's let's just have a very quick look at some stories here. Um, uh, Sylvia, I'm pretty sure, I, I don't know, maybe uh, you've probably prototyped that diving gear at some point. My kids did the, something very similar to this. <laughs> I can't, it's a bicycle pump and it was a, like a plastic bucket and a hose. And the yeah. one was, was pumping the pump and then egging the other one on to go into the pool. Well, I'm hoping that water isn't too deep. Yeah, no, it was, thank God. It was yeah. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, the guy with the bicycle blocks. Right. Yeah, the cement blocks are a nice touch. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to have a look. We're going to have a look at some weird urchins of Antarctica. Um, some slow motion changes, chases, urchin biodiversity in the Philippines, and the value of sand dollars. What keeps the dollar up? Antarctica. Uh, I've been there a couple of times, done some trawling work in the deep, deep sea there, and um, it's uh, just, it's like another planet. Yeah. A truly, truly different sort of environment. And as you might expect, the sea urchins are a little bit strange to go with that. 
let's have a look at the next. You think we're a little strange if you ask them. Uh, yeah, it's all your point of view. And this is a point of view from, from over 500 meters. <laughs> um, <laughs> Antarctica really is full of life, even under the ice shelves. And we did some bottom photography uh, we did some trawling, uh, research trawling to try and find out to, to sort of ground truth what we were seeing. And you really couldn't take a photo of any sea bottom there without getting at least one echinoderm in it. I mean, they were like, they were like um, photobombing everything. <laughs> um, the, uh, the one on the left shows a, a little community on, on a single rock that's probably fallen off the bottom of an iceberg at some point. Um, uh, the glacial, um, uh, the glaciers come out, calve off, and um, they'll have rubble in them, and they drop them off, and you'll, you'll see these rocks on the bottom, and any hard spot is, uh, becomes a home for all kinds of animals. I, I, I can see a starfish, a sea urchin, uh, at least one species of sea urchin, and yeah. a sea lily, um, all on that, you know, all that, in that single photo. That, that sea, sea lily is beautiful on there. And there are also some brittle stars there. So what what phylum are we missing? Maybe a sea cucumber? And there may actually be a sea cucumber. I'll bet you there's a, one on there. class are we missing? <laughs> there's probably one in there. Yeah, yeah. One in there. The, the photo on the right shows a, um, a few of those wonderful big sea spiders that walk around, mm -hmm. the pycnogonids. Um, but there's plenty of arms sticking out of the bottom. Those aren't worms. Those little white fingery things sticking out are the arms of uh, brittle stars. It's so cool. They're everywhere. You know, people think when they, some do, that mud, <laughs> such as you're, you're sitting there, mud. Yeah. it's just mud. But it's, it's just mud. Just mud. It's, it's a metropolis. Metropolis. It's living. Metropolis. It's, living. metropolis. <laughs> it's a metropolis, and at the microscopic level, um, it's full of life, and that is actually what these irregular sea urchins, the ones that move through the through the mud, um, that's what they're exploiting. They're exploiting the fact that there's so much life and organic material in there for them to, to feed on. That's, that's, that was what they adapted to take advantage of. Um, so here's some more weirdness about Antarctica, giant predatory worms, these big sea spiders, some strange flattened isopods that look almost like trilobites, and these wonderful Dumbo octopuses, uh, just, just a magical, incredible place to, to, um, to visit, but you wouldn't want to live there. No, we're well, headed there soon. These no. live there and they're happy there. They don't want to be anywhere else. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's the thing. We should do our utmost to make sure that that can continue. There's a new there's a new predator in Antarctica, and that would be humans. You know, the, the Absolutely. was not discovered until 1820. Yeah. Yeah. We're yeah. we're so new on the scene and we've already made first I mean, thing that the, the mighty explorers exploited were the seals. I mean, when you think Palmer was an American sealer, right? Uh, Weddell, but yeah. there's Weddell seal, but he did a really good job of killing <laughs> many of the animals for which he's named. And so it goes. Ross was one of the few who went as a scientist rather than an that's, exploiter. That's absolutely true. That's but absolutely true. Knock off the seals and it got to be unprofitable. So they turned to the penguins and then they turned to the whales. Now krill, krill and the deep sea fish mm -hmm. and all of the creatures that you're seeing here, they're just bycatch. They're just lost in the process. Yeah, there there have been some really important articles about what krill really mean mm -hmm. uh, in, in the recent literature. I think Science Magazine had a couple yeah. Uh, pieces on that and it's it's oh. really staggering but but we also have um a Look very abundant and and those krill are feeding on something right so they're they're probably feeding on um the reproductive products of all kinds of sea bottom dwelling forms huh. but not actually not these so much um because the antarctic urchins escape that phase of uh, early life of being a planktonic organism by having the females retain the young. That's and they do this in a variety of different ways. Um, they lay the eggs, which are then passed down um, by probably by the tube feet, and they kind of do a little uh, pinball machine thing with the spines <laughs> until, they, until they find themselves inside a cavity around the mouth. So if you look at that picture in the upper left, that's a, a, a cleaned 
test of one of these sea urchins and you can see there's a depression around the mouth around where the teeth come come protruding and in the picture on the right you can see these red babies inside that pouch so beautiful so these yeah, pencil, well, like pencil little... urchins are brooding their young but wait yeah. there's more <laughs> wow. now, this one is actually brooding the young. This is an irregular urchin now, a hard urchin, basically related to the hard urchins. And it lays eggs that fall into these or are guided into these deep pouches um, around where these respiratory structures are. Um, and they become extremely deepened into um, really marsupia in um, some of these hard urchins, and they brood their young in there. Mama, uh, they're mama urchins. But I mean, the ultimate, the next slide is the ultimate in um, brood protection, uh, protecting the young, maternal care. This fuzzy little sort of potato here um, <laughs> is, is actually a sea urchin. It's an irregular sea urchin. And if you, if you make a cross section through that, you see this very highly developed um, really staggeringly complex set of brood pouches that hang down from a hole in the very top of the, the sea urchin. And that hole is too small to allow the passage of the babies out through the birth canal. So these things are actually giving birth by making that hole bigger by folding the plates down. Wow. Almost like a trap door. And then the young can travel out because they can be as much as like ten or more percent of the length of the of huh. the female. Yeah, the so, female. So is, how, how does this get figured out? Who spends? <laughs> who? Who? <laughs> who? My uh, that, <laughs> yeah. um, myself and a, a colleague in in France um, who visited me when I was uh, doing a postdoc at the Smithsonian. He says have you seen these very strange sea urchins in this drawer? And I said, yes, I have. I said, what the heck is going on with those? And that um, started a, a process, not, not only a long-term association with which um, I've been so happy to work with this man, Bruno David, he's actually the president of the Paris Museum right now. Um, he and I worked on a variety of different sea urchin projects. This was one of them. And we described this entire system, how it worked, the anatomy of the brood pouches, the young. We did a lot of studies of um, the, how the, the babies grow and what was present and so on. And um, it wasn't until some years later that I was able to go to the Antarctic myself um, where I could actually see these live um, hmm. caught, caught by the trawls. Incredible. Um, and it was it brought a tear to my eye <laughs> yeah. to see these friends that I'd spent so much time with trying to figure out how, how they make their life. Uh, I think it says something rather wonderful about humans. There are a lot of bad things to say about us, but sea urchins don't study us, but we are really curious about them. We and, are. And, and to the length of the, the commitment you've made to just kind of figure out who are you? you know, what are you doing? It's It's... It's, it's our saving saving grace, I think, that we... Well, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I, I love fossils. I love paleontology. They are important to the things that I study because these all of these sea urchins fossil, actually, echinoderms in general, fossilize so, so wonderfully. With the exception of the sea cucumbers, it's hard to fossilize. Um, right. Not, basically, but um, they, they are... Um, how can I say this? It's... it's, it's the the joy of discovery comes flooding in the moment you open a rock and see something that no one or no other organism in fact has seen for millions of years and you just like <laughs> bam <laughs> bam <laughs> that's special that's special so and if you can, can if you can when you go into the deep sea and Same nobody's thing. seen most of what's out there we're just exactly. you know maybe maybe Five percent, possibly ten percent, has been seen by some human. Right, right. It's most of the planet. We're gonna jump over to, to some Q and A before we sure. run out of time today. Um, Carolyn is asking. She says, "I'm so excited! I did a master's degree on sea star predation on sponges um, in New England. Are you familiar with the species? What do we have here, Enrica?" 
Oh, Henricia. Henricia, thank you. Yeah. Sanguinolenta, is that the one? Yes, that's the one. The Blood Star. The Blood Star. <laughs> Hence the name. <laughs> <laughs> Hence the name, Sanguinolenta. And so it, it's predatory on sponges, huh? Um, I believe so, yeah. Um, starfish hey, eat a variety of, uh, of different things. And um, I wouldn't be at all surprised if they find sponges tasty. Yeah. <laughs> Um, why are, we have a question, why are sea stars often called starfish? Oh, no. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tick some people off here. But I, I, it, sea star is a, is a relatively recent term. It was invented because people felt that starfish weren't fish, right? That's true. Um, so, so, and, and that is true. Um, but they're also not stars. They're well, not flaming go. balls of gas in space. <laughs> um, so, you know, what are you going to do about something like seahorses? Not a horse. <laughs> not a horse. Lives in the sea, but it's not a horse. At least there you're in the same category of, of organisms. They're vertebrates, right? Um, so I, I have gone back to the old and venerable term to make a point. And that is that um, what we call things is important. Indeed it is. But I think if you are not able to understand what I'm saying when I say starfish and that it really isn't a fish, and that's a teaching point, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you don't need to fall back on what, what I actually regard as a politically correct term um, that was probably not really necessary. Um, so, and I, and I, the educators came up with this. It certainly wasn't the scientists. No, um, I'm, I'm with you, um, with the National Geographic Big Ocean book that we produced just last year. I insisted, starfish. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a taxonomist as well, right? And so I fall back on the rules of priority. And as far as I know, starfish was used before sea star. Um, maybe yeah. not. But, but I have a feeling that that's, that's true. By whatever but, name, they smell as sweet. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Especially out on the deck after a few hours. All right. So Stacy is asking us, um, if an area has been depleted where sea urchins thrived, could a sea urchin be reintroduced? If so, what's the best way to go about that? Ooh, um, well, you probably want to make sure that you're restoring things that should be there in the first place. And so mm -hmm. um, we just had an instance where um, I heard about this incredible project where Pycnopodia, which is the sunflower star, which has been extirpated from most of the coast of California now, um, is, is being bred in captivity, but it's not going to be returned to places where the juveniles came from that they're breeding them. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it restoration is a very tricky subject very tricky um, and mm -hmm. you need to do it right and it has to be science driven there's some talk about trying to introduce urchins to hawaii where a introduced seaweed one that they have cultivated is is um, kind of covering the reef and so the solution that some have come up with is we just need more sea urchins there to eat the algae. Uh, meanwhile, here in California, sea urchins are being demonized because well, they there are too many of them. They, I mean, I don't think there are too. How could there be too many sea urchins? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, there can be. Um, and and um, I think in in the case of the sea urchins that are that are chewing on the kelp beds, it's a very it's it's a difficult subject. To, um, politically charged, uh, driven by some special interest groups um, who would like to see the removal of all of those sea urchins. But I, I need to remind people, and I often do, that um, those sea urchins are actually native species. Yes. Um, they were there long before we were, and we're happily living in those kelp beds and the cycle was complete and and everything was fine a I place think we, need, I, it, we cannot demonize animals that essentially don't have a brain i mean how, how do you do that um the vilification of sea urchins is disturbing to me because i think it puts people on 
either one side or the other side of the issue. Um, when what we really need is is science driven discourse about how to solve this problem. And it, it right. is the problem. There is no doubt about it. Yeah. Um, help beds are are suffering. There are people that are concerned about that and trying to fix the problem by doing some culling of sea urchins, but not wholesale total destruction. I mean, I, it feels unethical to me to go in there and pick up a whole lot of sea urchins and stuff them in bags and carry them off to the landfill. I know, uh, it's just unethical. I mean, it, it's not their fault. We it's are not the their fault. Um, we the ones who messed up the system. But at the same, yes, exactly. So I think we need to point the demonizing finger at the right agency here and, and <laughs> look in the mirror. <laughs> um, and I do think that there are, there are ways to, to do this culling um, in a scientifically driven manner that, that, that is data driven, that allows us to figure out what's going on. There are people very interested in trying to get a market built for the purple sea urchin. Um, so that people will too. And, well, <laughs> it, it is, it, we then replace the predators that we've killed off, yeah. okay? which is often the case. You have native deer running everywhere, eating people's gardens. That's because we've removed all the predators that kept them in check. Um, I would like to know what the answer would be if, if, if by removing the predators, some native squirrel went, ran around eating all of the native grasses and destroying native habitats and what we would do about that sort of situation. I'm pretty sure we wouldn't be collecting all of the squirrels and gassing them and things like that. I, I just feel like there is a respect for nature that needs to be observed here. Mm -hmm. and there, there is a, a way to solve this problem that um, doesn't have to be unethical, um, that can be economically feasible for everybody concerned because you're not going to solve this issue without making sure that human market driven and social you can social economic driven forces are not taken into account no that's true and i've heard a lot of people say that you know like there's a lot of the the rock fish and the other ground so-called ground fish that will eat uh small urchins before they get you know super spiny while they're still fairly vulnerable that's and, true and that a lot of the um the take and the, and the commercial take and the recreational take of those of those fish um, is also part of the problem in addition to um, the, the lack of the sea stars. Right, and I, I see a question in the in the Q&A there about uh, Pycnopodia helianthoides, which is the sunflower starfish, right. which mm -hmm. is a, a magnificent animal that gets to be, you know, like a yard across with 30 some odd arms. I love those, yeah. And they're, they go charge charging through the environment, eating everything inside, including sea oh, urchins. Yeah. <laughs> but of course, <laughs> they've been extirpated by this, this um, probably the pathogen, the wasting disease. Um, and you can't find them anymore. I mean, they're, they're nowhere to be seen. And I think that's one of the primary reasons that this, the, um, the uh, purple sea urchin population exploded. So what is the reason behind that, that explosion of disease? Could be related to um, global climate change, warming in the environment. Um, the of course we've removed the sea otters and i see that there's a yeah. mm -hmm. an excellent suggestion to introduce more sea otters yeah. i think that would be great um yeah. we know we know that <laughs> sea otters chop on on sea urchins um to their heart's content to the point where you if you have skeletons of certain um examples of sea otters they're they're um their skull is actually purple from the amount of pigment <laughs> Uh, the, just the, like the horn the, shark right the, they get little purple lips you know yeah yes exactly exactly but, but um exactly so it's a tricky and and complicated it's more complicated than going out and smashing every sea urchin that you can find. Sure, sure. absolutely you're not going to solve the problem but it is it's it's like taking that holistic look and saying you know what can we do to, to bring back the sun stars what can we do to right. to expand you, the, the sea otters and and <laughs> Yeah, but you can't even make a fishery around the sea urchins that are there now because they're basically zombie urchins. Yeah, they're just like they've run out of food. Yep. Uh, just like the abalone and all of the other things that live in these these kelp forests. And the first thing a sea urchin does when it runs out of food is start resorbing some of the organic material that that is in its gut and so on. And so they're just sitting there in a kind of stasis 
space. Um, They're not feeding on anything anymore. But it, it would be cool not to have a commercial market because <laughs> then it becomes locked in and rather look at the value of urchins alive than urchins dead. I, I fully agree with you. Um, but again, uh, you, you need to have you need to have the public on your side. And so you yeah, need to find ways you. to do this that is sustainable, right? Yeah. If it is. Uh, yeah. So we're at we're at the we're at the top of the hour. And I just wanted to I'm I'm hoping you'll come back again. We'll talk about other branch of branches of echinoderms. And... There, there's lots more to talk about, as you can tell. <laughs> So we, we hope we, we hope we can convince you to come back and, and we'll we'll dive into I'd be delighted. That this has be been fun. We've loved, been loved having you. Fun. Love the conversation. Been a lot of fun. And before we go, um, thank you again, Rich, and thank you, Ocean Elders and everyone in the community dive in that keeps showing up and, mm -hmm. and talking with us today. And as we know, water connects us all. And we're so grateful to everyone. We're gonna be back in February. And until then, remember. We have to take care of the ocean. As if our lives depend on it. Because they, they do. do. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, everyone. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.